Well, good morning. Good afternoon. It's not morning yet. I'm sorry. I'm still on state time. Uh, as indicated, my name is Felicia Nave, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Prairie View, which is a historically black college uh, outside of Houston, Texas, in Prairie View, Texas. Um, I am also a full professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Prairie View a and University. So the presentation for today talks about um, the advanced project that we had at Prairie View, which focused in particular on the women faculty who were um, matriculating through the academic ranks or administrative ranks at the, at the time, eight institutions that had engineers, colleges or schools of engineering. Oh, I didn't do something right. Okay, there we go. So being here in Berlin, uh, we didn't want to not give tribute to Audre Lorde, who has done a lot of work around African Americans and inter the intersectionality of race and gender, which is one of the bedrocks of what our research and work focused on, that although in general there are issues related to women in STEM, there are some things that are specific or issues that face women of color um, that present themselves in a different context, in a different order. This is just a slide to give you a little bit of background on, on the institution type that I work in. Prairie View is a historical black college, and his, there are about 107 of those in the states. And they were started to educate African American, um, African American students who could not gain entry into universities in the United States throughout our history. As it relates to STEM in particular, whereas they all of the 107 may have STEM programs, more specifically when you get to engineering uh, and computer science programs, there are fewer programs. We have uh, 11 colleges, historical black colleges, that have ABET accredited College of Engineering programs. And so in these institutions, whereas they share some of the same uh, issues and concerns, we have a, a, a good number of women women faculty, when it gets to the STEM areas, particularly engineering, then we start to see some of the same issues and challenges that you see at your predominantly white institutions as well. These are just his, um, national numbers from the U.S. perspective around women faculty in STEM. Women faculty comprise about 25.7 percent of uh, the tenured faculty in STEM at four-year colleges and universities, although at most of our institutions institutions, you will see that um, women students make up more than half of the students who are there. In terms of women of color in STEM, they represent only 2.3 percent of the tenure or tenure track faculty, but yet 5.1 percent of the non-tenure track faculty, despite the fact that they make up African Americans about 13 percent of the U.S. population. So they're there, they're not there in the numbers of tenure, tenure track small numbers in the non-tenure, but you see that they're being tracked toward the positions that don't hold the level of um, prestige or, or um, girth within the institution. And so why are those issues? What are the things that we can do from an institutional level in order to increase this number, but also make sure that they're in the roles of significance within the institution? Uh, one of the studies that we looked to uh, and worked um, worked with is a report that was put out by Kelly Mack, Claudia Rankin, and Cynthia Winston that looked over a 10-year period of how um, in the STEM areas the women versus men enrollment numbers have been specifically black, white, and Asian men and women. And, all, and you can see that from 93 to 2006 we've had a significant increase in the number of African-American women who have come into the uh, HBCU Academy. Uh, we are seeing increases in white women, 
when you're seeing some decline in white men and increases in, in uh, black women. So the question becomes, do we have the institutional support to support these women's matriculation and success in this institution? So in using this information, what we know in general about women and their ability or support to progress through the academy, we participated in a number of um, programs, workshops, grants, partnerships uh, with predominantly white institutions and looking at how ways to strengthen the women faculty at our institution. But what we found is although many of the issues are the same, the context is different. How these programs and whether or not the initiatives or the interventions actually work for women of color or for African-American faculty specifically, particularly in a HBCU environment, which some may say, okay, it's, 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 it's a minority environment, so surely it's different that that was not the case, that these women experienced the, some of the same, if not all of the same issues, but in just in a different context. So the interventions that were common that were there, although um, good interventions worked, they did not work for the women in these types of environments. So in... We submitted for, under the advanced project, an advance paid. And with the paid, it was not for you to necessarily create all these new interventions or initiatives, but to take some of those best practices that were already developed under prior advances and then um, modify them in order to fit into a different context or in, in, in different environment. So you were applying them to a different group and, and trying to, um, to determine ways to figure out how they work better. So the goals of the whole project was to develop a continuum of activities that assisted women faculty in their professional development and growth while retaining them in the academic and administrative ranks at historical black colleges and universities. It was a partnership between faculty at Prairie View A&M University and our sister institution, Texas A&M University. So our broad objectives were to create a professor of affinity communities to explore the different perspectives of the key holders because we understood from the onset that it wasn't just about making sure that the female faculty um, were doing the things that they needed to or being developed, but also making sure that we were engaging all of the players that would be involved in, in ensuring their success. So that includes the deans, the department heads, and the upper administration, administrative levels <clears throat> where applicable. That we were to establish communication mechanisms for lifelong engagement. The women faculty at these institutions really were a, um, a group who were a network who could help each other. Because the institutions, some of the challenges and experiences that they were seeing, they were the same or similar across institutions, but yet different than, say, some of their counterparts at other institutional types. So how could we establish communications that would allow them to continue this even once the project were, was gone? And then to disseminate these best practices to the HBCU uh, engineering administrators. The four primary uh, interventions that I'll talk about that were that came significant from the project was an annual workshop that was held in Houston, Texas, uh, each year for three consecutive years, seed grants to support the research efforts, career coaching, and the writing groups. And here I'll just kind of go through some of the successes and then some of the lessons learned that we got from those. The first one uh, would be the seed grants. And there their primary purpose was to provide the um, startup funding that at most HBCUs was not available. Um, many HBCUs, if not all, they are small regional institutions that just don't have the financial resources to provide the big startup packages that you may see at larger research institutions. So when the faculty come in, they have high teaching loads, they're expected to do research, but whether or not the environment really facilitates that is not there. And one of the key areas that was lacking was the funding. When we talked to our advisory group, for which Jan Reinhart was a part of that advisory group, uh, other deans and um, 
faculty who had been successful, successful at HBCUs. One of the key points that came out as being a huge barrier for these women um, achieving success, matriculating through the ranks, was research. Whether or not they had the research profile and the research success that garnered the respect from their peers in order to matriculate through. Well, given the challenge of no money coming in, if there weren't any centers that were there, or they didn't have any connections, say they were straight out of the graduate school, then this was a significant challenge for them. The money that many of them had been able to achieve was programmatic or engineering education type of research. At the time when we did this project, engineering education research, programmatic research, was not as respected as having that same technical credential and profile. Because keep in mind, most of their peers were male. And they were looking for, if you are a serious, say, chemical engineering, then you need to have a strong technical chemical engineering um, uh, research profile. Well, they had no money. So the grants, so we provided grants for these women faculty across these 11 different institutions in order to help establish their technical research agenda. But we didn't just give them money because we saw that as a potential problem as well. Money without some type of control, controlled infrastructure wasn't going to help them matriculate through. So in, in putting together a proposal for the grant, you had to find a technical mentor in your area of expertise who was recognized in the field, who was already published, and who already had money. And in that way, you were starting to build a network, and you had funds to help you get your research up off the ground. We awarded 11 of these grants total. No, I can't add 19, 11, 12, 13. 13 grants total, and then one which was a collaboration between two two institutions. And this was a highly successful um, um, pro uh, initiative for us. The majority of those, the women who received these grants, I would say about 80%, were able to secure additional technical research funding from using the seed money that we provided. And everyone who participated in this program subsequently indicated to us that it was, it was a significant contributor to their ability to being tenured and promoted when it came up within the next two to three years. The second, um, a second initiative that we uh, started as a result of the third initiative not being as successful was the career coaching. Um, for many of the women, um, whether or not they came with some of the background knowledge and, and capacity in having the mentors and the networks that they needed to be successful. For example, at, at Prairie View, when I was hired in 2003, three other women were hired as well. Well, all of us was the first and only female in our respective departments. And this was in 2003. Uh, and after that, they, we didn't really do as well hiring anymore, but we were, they were isolated. You didn't have mentors and so forth in place on site. Uh, so we created a group within ourselves, but even there we saw that the trying to get together, the traditional mentor type of model, really didn't seem to work as well. So we put in to have coaches, which is more individualized and more personalized. What we discovered, and in the um, reporting out at the end, uh, which is on the mentoring slide, when you add into the, the cultural context of how women of color uh, engage or interact, some of the traditional mentoring models do are not applicable to those women. Culturally, they, they don't engage in the same way. And so they were not, the traditional mentoring model just wasn't as successful for those women. When we asked or looked at just the institutional type, because they already had higher service expectation, they were already had their you know, the job in the morning, the job in the evening, this became one more thing that they had to do with the traditional mentoring model. And so whether, rather seeing it as a benefit, it actually became a burden. And so although many of them started out 
trying to participate in. In, in, in any relationship, which a mentor relationship is, you got to give and take. It's the yin and the yang. But if you don't feel like you have the time in order to work this in, then it's not as helpful as it could be. Uh, so taking given into consideration the time issue. Culturally, it wasn't something that they really like to engage in. We don't sit around, if I use myself as an example, in Kumbaya with four or five people, I'm um, better in more of a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Then we looked at the career coaching as a better option. And from that, that actually worked so much better. The women got so much more out of having that one-on-one -on -one person, it became their accountability person. Um, and it helped them even with the fourth initiative, which was the writing part. Instead of having to be a part of a group or set up scheduled meetings, teleconference, or whatever that you just got to find out how to add it to your curriculum, they became that person who could help them navigate that, see the importance, and be, help them structure their time so that they could get the things done that they wanted to do. So with the writing group, um, as indicated, it started off really well, um, but in the end, it, it kind of fizzled out because it became one of those extra responsibilities that they had to do. So the ladies who were successful with getting some increased publications and increased grants were those who had the coach as opposed to those who just participated in the writing group. Um, a colleague at Jackson State, um, Loretta Moore, she has seen great success in her um, program where they have a writing group component, where it deferred in what we um, tried to, uh, what we attempted, is that they put in concentrated time where the women get together, say, in the summer, and that's all that they do, and that's all that they focus on. They buy out their time, they buy out their responsibilities, so then it's replaced as opposed to being added on top of. So that, that approach that um, Jackson State uh, took from what I could observe worked so much better than what we did and where we tried to integrate it on top of what they were already doing. So even though we provided the, um, um, the writing coach, uh, the person who worked with them, who reviewed their papers, who edited, finding the time. There just wasn't enough time. And the last one that we, we forgot to put the slide in about the annual conferences, those were very successful. And the way that they uh, were structured, we had them a week after the end of the semester. So it was a professional development as well as a vacation uh, for the women. So they got to learn and play at the same time. The topics that were picked were not just organizer driven. We took a lot of feedback from the women themselves who participated to tell us what it was that they thought they needed. They had to build off of the, um, the workshops that we had in prior year. We took we took in, we did a survey of the deans and the department heads to get their perspective to see what they thought that the women faculty could benefit from in uh, growing, as well as from our advisory group. And taking in all of that information, we were able to build uh, the workshops and really um, grow and leverage each year, always adding in a wellness component for the workshop. Uh, the, the takeaways, as I uh, come to a conclusion, is that the SEED grant program is something that we recommended in the end for each, um, each engineering dean to institutionalize, not so much just to give money, but to give them a structured way in order to use the funds and associate with someone who was in their field, who was in their line of research to ensure that they were successful. The career coaching for this group of women, for the women of color um, that we worked with across these institutions worked better. So rather than just starting a mentoring program or a coaching program, really trying to understand what the needs of the women who you're working with are. Best practices are good, but they still don't apply.
to everyone. So understanding the context and the women and their norms, who we are is who we are, and what are your cultural norms and how that impacts um, your, um, your the program that you should take. And then with the writing groups, this is one that really we need to restructure, or we needed to restructure and rethink how we offered it. Because the publication is important. Increasing the grant right is important, but the approach that we took and to try to support the women just wasn't the most successful uh, one. And so I leave you uh, with this quote from Andre Lord, and uh, thank you, and, and open up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Felicia, for your presentation and telling us about what you are doing in uh, historical black colleges and universities in the United States. I suppose I'm we sorry. have some... I forgot to add one point. Although the slide wasn't here, for all of the ladies who participated in the program or retained, they, we were pulling the numbers now, but they were all tenured, promoted, We've had an increase in the number who've moved into the full professorship ranks, and several of the ladies who participated in the program who never thought about administrative roles are now in administrative leadership roles at these institutions. So that's our biggest takeaway that we know the work we did worked. So thank you um, for telling us about the results and the achievements you've uh, succeeded. Um, does anyone in the Room once yes, a question there. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think this is more of a comment than a question, but I'm in, in Canada. I don't know if you know Melinda Smith at the University of Alberta, but she's looked at uh, race and, and leadership in Canadian universities, and it's terrible. So it's really encouraging to see um, some significant advancements. That last part where you were saying that the, having people move to the full professor level, that's the group that's going to be picked to go into the administration. And so if you're not getting people up through the ranks, yeah. you're not going to get people into these leadership positions. So I think Canadian universities have a lot to learn from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to share thoughts or some view or a question? So maybe you can uh, tell us about more about the data of people who um, uh, achieved a full, uh, you said that, uh, to a full professor promotion. Uh, some of, there was a number of participants who achieved that. Uh, do you know uh, the per percentage of those who achieved to get the full promotion professor? So we're pulling all of the numbers down now, so I don't have the number the percents, but I know when we started the project in 2009, across the 11 institutions, there were only five women uh, who were at the full professor rank. I know that we've more than doubled uh, that now, and I can't say all of that is attributed to this project, um, but just the collective efforts that have gone on focusing on uh, women of color in STEM, the work that Advance has done in particular in having their um, focus on uh, women of color. But I do know that, uh, and we're getting the exact number, but it has more than doubled in terms of the number of women faculty at historical black colleges who have now moved into the full professor rank. I'm one of those. Uh, at our institution, uh, of those five ladies, they've all been tenured and promoted uh, to uh, our, we now have three of the initial five who are full professors, uh, two are at the associate professor level, one is a department head, and I, I guess moved to the highest academic rank at the university and to provost. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, we know from institutions it was significant, but we also saw that at, um, when we started, We've, we had about 50 to 60 women across all 11 institutions as our pool. That pool now is over 100. And so there's been some significant growth in terms of uh, the number of women professors who've moved into the uh, tenure track, um, tenure or tenure track ranks at HBCUs. And the thinking of the deans has shifted so that engineering education is now valued more and they're getting more credit for that as they're matriculating through. An area that we did lose ground uh, is in the deanship. When we went in, there were 
at least two female deans out of the 11, and right now we're back to one, and that's Robin Kroger at um, North Carolina a &T. So there's still a lot of work <laughs> to be done at that senior leadership level. Yeah, thank you so much. There's a question. Jen Reinhardt at Northeastern and Boston, USA. Felicia, in, in your dealings with the wider community of women of color, when you talk about mentoring and then it didn't work culturally because it was one more thing and so the coach worked better, do you think that's true also of women of color who are in majority institutions? Or have you seen any other mentoring models other than coaching work for the community? So I would, I'm a narrow it to Texas. And I can say that uh, from our interactions with our women of color colleagues at other Texas institutions, they're seeing this experience in the same thing. The mentoring doesn't work. And it's not as, some of it is this one extra thing, but the other part of it is that of the women that they have to be paired with in these mentoring relationships, there's not enough other women of color, uh, and so the, it doesn't work. We are part of um, our partner with University of Houston in theirs, and they tried a mentor net approach uh, for women, and the women of color it just did not work very well because they didn't have enough paired matches. And so where it played out is in um, that common experience, right? And some of the comments that were made from um, um, and implicit biases. I think one of the comments that came back to me that was said from the female at the predominantly white institution is she was trying to partner up with her um, Afri African American in this case was, well, do you have a car? And now whether she meant anything by it or not, it wasn't it wasn't perceived very well. And so there are just some cultural differences that are not always addressed in that broader mentoring model that can actually negatively impact the success of that mentoring program. So for Texas, I would say, yes, what we saw um, is what you're seeing in the broader PWIs. And I would suggest that they take a different approach or a different look at whether or not that mentor net type of thing really works for women of color. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felicia. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.